I'm Mark Gagan, and you're listening to the Voice of Insurance podcast, produced in association with Advantage Go, enabling enterprise-scale underwriting through a single pane of glass. Jonathan Zvino, president of Ascot Group, is one of the industry's great thinkers. Ascot is one of the Lloyd's Market's most successful underwriting outfits of the last 20 years, and Jonathan is leading that group's expansion into the key US market. But his style of expansion is not an aggressive kind that pursues growth by taking big bets. It's a far more nuanced and subtle approach, and one that recognises some of the big secular changes that have been taking place in the insurance market over the last two decades. Behind the detail in our discussion, lots of big themes are lurking. I enjoy how our conversation can start with specifics on trends in areas such as delegated authority, but quickly change gear and end up encompassing much loftier themes, such as the disaggregation of the insurance value chain as a whole, and the advent of far more mercurial forms of capital provision. Ascot is a business with a strong identity and market presence, and we talk about how the firm is looking to distill and preserve that culture as it grows, evolves, and seeks new ownership in a fast-changing market. Listening back, the most common word Jonathan uses in this podcast is candidly, and that's apparent all the way through our discussion. This is what he really thinks about the challenges and the opportunities in the market today. Learning what the market's finest minds really think about the world is what this podcast is all about, so I can highly recommend this episode to anyone seeking inspiration and enlightenment. Enjoy the podcast. This episode is supported by Oxbow Partners. Oxbow Partners is a management consulting business specialising in the London, Bermuda and European insurance and reinsurance markets. In fact, in 2021 and 2022, they were named one of the top 10 consultancies in the sector by the Financial Times. It's fascinating speaking to the team about the kinds of topics they're supporting. Helping reinsurers take a strategic view of their operating models. Designing smart follow syndicates in the Lloyds market. And developing ESG responses. The company's strapline talks about giving executives a fresh perspective. So if you're keen to understand the challenges and opportunities coming down the track for your business, I'd recommend giving the team at Oxbow Partners a call. Well, John, welcome to The Voice of Insurance. Thank you, Mark. Great to be with you. Well, you've been president of Ascot for the last two years now. What was it attracted you to that role? And what's the experience been like? Yeah, well, thanks. I could probably spend the full hour on this, but sort of sum it up by saying, Ascot, we're on an incredibly exciting journey here. And candidly, it was pretty easy to become enthusiastic about joining the organization, having the prospect of joining the organization. If I think back, and this has probably been somewhat front and center for me throughout my career, which is now I'm getting into the nearly 30 years, 28 plus years in the business. I think it starts with kind of the basics. It's always been about the people. If I think back to those first interactions I had with Ascot, with Andrew Brooks, a couple of things certainly jumped out to me and that inspired me to want to join the Ascot journey. And I would say Andrew and I share certainly that, that passion for building, for building great companies, companies with great cultures. It was very clear to me, the culture of the Ascot group really jumped off the page in those early days. It was unique. It was a bit different. And it's something that I've really enjoyed learning more about candidly and hopefully contributing to in a significant way as we've moved forward. Certainly, the underwriting pedigree of the organization was pretty clear. It had a very long-term track record. I knew of it, didn't know it that well, to be honest with you, in terms of what drove that. But certainly having the opportunity to meet additional colleagues, such as Mark Pepper, our group CEO and head of reinsurance, really solidified that in my mind, along with a number of other colleagues I was able to meet along the way. The other thing I would say, too, is it's quite mission-centric, not afraid to try new things. And of course, we find ourselves at a, another interesting inflection point in our history and the opportunity to chart a new course. So all those things kind of jumped off the canvas, if you will. And then for me personally, having the opportunity to have a remit that looked across the entirety of the group, coming in, of course, joining as the group president, but having that unfiltered view across insurance, reinsurance, our underwriting services business, which, by the way, kind of summed up a lot of my prior experiences, was, of course, very, very attractive to me. And then when you looked at all the resources we had across, whether it's our tech, risk and actuarial, finance, legal, so many others, those things that enable the business every day, 
having direct access in that regard and working with those colleagues, that was really, really compelling. And back to my comment on enjoying building organizations, the U.S. platform was in a very raw state. It was in its infancy. So having the opportunity to shape that in kind of a modern way that hopefully delivered a lot of value for all of our constituents, particularly our clients, assemble that team. That was a unique opportunity and really work with such a talented group of professionals. So great opportunity to build something special with great people, execute a bit of a unique plan, I believe, and with the support of Ascot. And it was very, very compelling to me. And I'm thrilled I made the decision to join. That's great. I mean, quite a challenge to have something that's almost version territory for Ascot and have almost a clean build of the US operation when you took over. It's a challenging market for anyone to come and enter. Obviously, it's a very large market, but a very competitive and very challenging one. And let's say it has been a graveyard for some London market insurers who've tried and failed, but some have succeeded. What was your game plan to make sure that Ascot would succeed and not be one of those London market operations who've not got traction? Yeah, look, I mean, if I look back, I mean, each situation is a bit different, isn't it? But I take the point, there's aspects of what we were trying to do that might look similar to previous efforts. And as you rightfully know, you know, not all of them were successful. I believe an underpinning of our early success in establishing the U.S. was really a sobering recognition that what works in London doesn't always work in the U.S. By the way, the reverse is often true as well. Regulations are different, as you know. Distribution is different. Portfolio construction can look very different. And of course, the cultures are different. But here's the thing from my vantage point. Our team at Ascot knew this. Andrew in particular knew this, and that's why they wanted to recruit talent to the organization that had experience in executing a successful build in the U.S. And by the way, those are not words I use lightly, a successful build. It's quite different than the, in my experience, than operating from an established platform. And I've done both. Yeah, There's different skills needed in a build, particularly one that was as true greenfield, if you will, as Ascot. So choreographing all the efforts needed to do this takes patience, perseverance, experience. In fact, I would say it takes a lot of experience. And Ascot knew this. Our board recognized it, and we had the ownership support to follow that path. So it really started from that vantage point. And I would say one other thing. While you have to take a view from geography to geography and recognize the differences, it doesn't mean you sacrifice building a common culture. You have that common set of beliefs, that unifying feel across the organization. So you're building something that's recognizably Ascot to a London Ascot person or taking the best of that underwriting culture, certainly the absolute thing that Ascot's best known for that core underwriting skill and having some of those core underwriting personalities throughout the organization. Some of those people have been there since the beginning. And you mentioned Mark Pepper. Yeah. The ability to retain some of those people over really long periods of time. But also we're divided by common language, aren't we? And (laughs) how to then give that a U.S. flavor that's going to make sense to someone in Texas, for example. Yeah, well, look, it's exactly as you said. There's common elements of our strategy we all agree on. Well, there's common things we all care about. Each part of our organization may execute its priorities a bit differently. Yet, I think if you look at any successful global organization, they're going to understand that while overarching strategy is, of course, global in nature, execution is always local. Starting from the premise, though, that there are common core principles we all care about is a huge, huge vantage point. So while there are local nuances, local differences, it doesn't sacrifice those bigger issues that kind of bind you together. So I think we've done a really good job of merging those two together. And by the way, it's a journey. It's a journey. You're constantly on that journey. You're constantly learning. I don't want to paint the wrong picture. It's not like we always harmonize on every issue. There are differences. There are debates there's well, discussions, you have, you have but, strong personalities in your organization, and, and I'm yeah. sure you encourage them to be strong and not to keep quiet if they've got something to say. <laughs> it's a company and a culture that celebrates collaboration, that really celebrates that debate, that truly does believe no one's got the monopoly on the great idea. So we work through it together. I like to say our issues are a little bit more on the surface because we are so open with each other. So we recognize what is required in one arena is going to be different than the other. But we debate, we discuss, and we make sure those overarching principles, the things we care about, are clear and kind of front and center in everyone's minds. Is it the way to distill this? Is it, is it about core underwriting? Is that always the most important thing? Look, we're an underwriting business. So yeah. yes, that's front and center. And what 
probably is directly attached to that or is definitely attached to that is how you think about risk. We tend not to get over our skis on anything. We're very thoughtful about risk. We're thoughtful about where we assume risk. We're disciplined in that regard. So it's all those building blocks of kind of core fundamental underwriting execution are things we all agree on. And that's what candidly has attracted a lot of people to the organization. But we also have other things in our history, if you look back, that are quite different. So we use this phrase and it's called the Ascot way. And part of that is described as a passion to find a better way. So I'm sure we'll get into it, but you know, the question we get often is, well, how does an MGU sit next to an insurance company? Yeah. How does that work? What's the choreography? Why? So if you look across the palette of the Ascot Group, you know, we have a pretty significant bench of capabilities that stems from that cultural belief there might be a better way to do things. And so it's not just the core underwriting we all believe in. It's also that constant passion, that constant intellectual curiosity, if I can call it that, about what can we do better? and if you have an open mindset, you know, we view Ascot as an ecosystem type company. If you have an open mindset, it's amazing sort of the solutions you see out there. Obviously, you were Everest before. Again, another yeah. very expansive company, also expanding very much into the US insurance market, away from Bermuda reinsurance and diversifying, but also diversifying internationally. And obviously, being a reverse flow. I mean, this is a globalized world, isn't it? Bermuda's in London, London's in Bermuda, everyone's in the US, and the US is everywhere. So, any learnings from your time at Everest from having set up Lloyd's operations and international operations that you've learned that you can now bring to this experience? For sure. Yes. I was leading Everest global insurance operations immediately prior to joining Ascot. And throughout the time there, we began to establish what I'll kind of call the various foundational pieces of international expansion. As you know, Lloyd's, which was a bit underway before my assuming that role. And also via an Irish insurance company subsidiary that we established during my time there, we had an OSFI regulated Canadian insurer. So we were starting to kind of build those foundational pieces. There's so many particulars, as you know, that are different across, again, the regulatory, legal, overall operating environment. But one of the key lessons for me, and candidly a notable professional journey for me, was really learning to understand or trying to understand the cultural differences. Again, back to that that either made the difference or candidly, oftentimes prevented success. So for those who have not ventured into the London or Western European market, which was our focus area, that's so why I kind of highlight that, there's lots and lots of lessons that'll be learned. Lloyd's is an incredibly unique market, as you know, and the corporation is a really unique institution. Look, the Lloyd's market has an incredible history, and I believe an exciting future in much of the work that's happening now. Yet the inner workings of how Lloyd's really works and operates, candidly, along with the governance structures, are quite different and come with a very steep learning curve. And for instance, if you think about the U.S. style of business, particularly that independent, sometimes kind of go-it-alone approach, that doesn't always translate well on a number of fronts into the London market. And that has to be understood. Yeah. For trading across the EU, the cultures and styles of business are as you know, so different from country to country, in some cases within regions of countries, that no singular approach is going to be successful. And obviously what drives their economies is different as well. So thinking of the EU as a single block is a strategy that is going to be rife with pitfalls. But another lesson learned, in my opinion, is the overextension of your ambition. And we've seen over time multiple companies that were really successful, candidly, in the U.S. that took an aggressive expansion approach. And not just in the U.S., that may have been successful in other areas as well, but took a very aggressive expansion approach across the EU and London and other parts of the globe, for that matter, and were challenged by many certain obstacles that are going to come with a build like that. You know, notably, the expenses associated with it, the difficulties in rationalizing the investments, the talent acquisition, and especially rationalizing the investments in the short term, because it's unquestionably a long-term gain. and can organic expansion prove successful? Sure it can. And some are indeed successfully executing that, but it's a long-term journey that requires that long-term commitment. And not all companies or boards or other constituents really have that tolerance for the long-term. Yeah. So I think those are a bunch of things that kind of jumped out to me. And what you've alluded to there, partly, is your strategies to keep that full flavor of Ascot and not dilute it in any way. And if that means that you can't conquer the whole of the world, then so be it. Is it more that you want to stay really focused and keep yourself highly concentrated 
so that you don't lose your identity. Obviously, it's easy to put on big numbers, but if the numbers don't mean anything, they might not be sort of pure ascot numbers if they're not done in the right way, right? We have sort of that golden triangle covered, which is the US, Bermuda, and London market. And that's an enormous part of the global PNC business, especially PNC insurance reinsurance business. Do we see opportunities to expand more? Oh, we do. We like our Lloyd's platform as the vehicle for that expansion. You may have seen we're expanding in the UK now via our MGU business and our services business, and we see opportunities with that. So I wouldn't take that off the table, but we think today we can cover a pretty wide swath of the global PNC trade and feel pretty comfortable with that. Opportunities when you take a step back and you think of what I mentioned a moment ago about our culture and that openness of the ecosystem, that desire to find a better way. One of the benefits of that is others see that. And so we get a lot of knocks on the door. And some of those knocks on the door may fit into this bucket of where we see possible international expansion. But I don't think you're going to see a marked departure of how we trade today and the vehicles in which we trade from. But I would expect this to expand somewhat over time. Absolutely. Well, we mentioned about MGAs, MGUs before. And obviously, part of your previous career was you were CEO of MGA Group Victor. We had a very large formation of MGAs towards the end of the soft market, but they seem to be more resilient this time. They've come through this harder market, most of them. What's behind this? It doesn't seem to be cyclical. It's easy to explain big formation of MGAs near the bottom of a soft market because you can talk about distribution, just put it getting the numbers down. But now that we've had three years of hardening, so many MGAs seem to be doing fine and have got through it. And maybe some of them had a shock with some losing some of their paper, but once they've replaced it, they've been fine. Do you think a secular change is happening here? The short answer is yes. I would say, for my background, as you mentioned, I had the pleasure of leading the U.S. operations for Victor during my days with Marsh McLennan. And I look back, it was a really enjoyable, candidly very informative and eye-opening experience. I didn't really appreciate at the time the distinct role that MGAs play in the value chain, more broadly speaking, or candidly, the complexity of operating an MGA in today's world. And and I'll use kind of MGA and MGU interchangeably in my articulation of this. But overall, I would say their role in the specialty business is most definitely here to stay. I do believe, Mark, there'll be some that won't survive longer term as there's undoubtedly kind of that fair amount of opportunism in the market yeah. fueling some of these startups. But that doesn't mean they'll vanish, but rather they might be consumed by a larger institution neither the MGA or carrier side. And you know, in the recent days, we've seen examples of both. I think one of the core pieces of your question, I think MGAs sit at this fascinating intersection of issues colliding somewhat across the specialty PNC landscape. And what are some of those issues? If you think about the world being somewhat a wash in capital, demand for specialty solutions continues to grow, technology is impacting really every step along the value chain. And there is, to the point you raised, there's been a bit of a resurgence in fronting capital and providers. And I think the other piece which we can't divorce from this conversation is the migration of talent. There's been a migration of talent to a number of these platforms. So part of the growth, in my opinion, is the combination of these factors along with, as you mentioned, the dynamic and favorable trading environment. But I think there's another thing here that has to be put on the table as we think about the sustainability or that secular shift that you referenced. And that's a bit of an open question as you kind of think of the full universe. I guess I would say there's trends in motion that I think will create some segregation of MGA platforms. And in the most basic sense, that will likely segregate those with more enterprise level platforms versus those that are perhaps talented underwriters, but let's say with infrastructure light scenarios. And of course, infrastructure here, I'm referring to technology, data, analytics, governance processes and the like. And you saw the recent well-publicized efforts by AM Best to rate what they refer to as DUAE, right? Delegated yeah. Underwriting Authority Enterprises. And that's a good example, in my opinion, of the momentum that will kind of create this segregation. And, and we see it. I mean, as you mentioned, we operate one and we see it from the trading partners who are asking questions. What are you doing here? What about this? What about that? And, and it seems to be kind of growing. But what I don't think is changing is MGA is serving a great purpose in the industry. They'll continue to innovate, solve niche problems. They're going to be great gateways to attract capital, match risk to capital. And I wouldn't discount their growing sophistication either, enabled by various technologies, tools, and sure techs. And I think 
all that sort of sets the stage for talent to likely continue to some degree to migrate into vehicles like that. So I think it's here to stay. Well, I had Bonnet Maziada on the show and he asked him a similar question and he said, well, the secular growth of MJs is because look how heavily we got regulated after the financial crisis. Guys with big balance sheets, we got regulated a lot more and MGAs didn't. He said it was almost as simple as that. Do you think that's a fair factor or fair comment? I think it's part of it. But I think the bigger theme is really more that disaggregation of the value chain. And they've got the speed, though. I suppose they have more speed. Well, three things always, in my mind, jumped out when you looked at the MGA, MGU landscape. And we see this from operating one. We see this from being a trading partner to many of them. And three things that always jump out are, what's the underwriting expertise? Again, that's that talent migration piece. Now being further bolstered by the various and short text data sources and so on and so forth. But underwriting expertise is sort of the first thing that attracts you to the table. Secondly is, are they more efficient? And maybe to some of Bronick's comments there, maybe that's part of it. It's a heavy lift in running regulated entities. So can an MGA, MGU give you something more efficient, whether that's tech driven or just something about their process that makes life a bit easier? But then the third thing, which I don't think has anything to do with the regulatory side, is distribution. Many of them have very unique distribution capabilities. And whether that's a access to the small commercial space, whether that's access within various trade associations. I know in my days at Victor, we had a lot of trade sponsorships that went back decades. For instance, the American Institute of Architects and others. So their distribution capabilities oftentimes differentiate them. And I think that's something you see some of them really putting a lot of effort and energy and muscle into. Is it a simpler model? I think it is. But this disaggregation of the value chain is also helping further the growth in that space. And how does Ethos, your own MGA, fit into this? Ethos is very much in the path to establishing themselves as one of those institutional or enterprise level platforms that we just talked about. We run about 11 or 12 different active niche programs through Ethos across our specialty PNC and transactional liability groups. They're one of the platforms that has attracted, in my opinion, world-class underwriting talent, relentlessly executing their plans. But it's supported by operations professionals, actuaries, claims advocates, dedicated distribution, and of course, the many underwriting resources and technologies and other services of the ASCOT group. So is it a way of appealing to an underwriter who perhaps you've targeted, you see they're really talented, but you just can't get them over the line as an ASCOT underwriter, but you can get them to be an ethos? Is it something about perhaps the more independent nature of of an MGA, that more sort of eat what you kill nature? There, There is definitely some of that. I think there's a bit of a distinction between what we'd like to refer to as niche versus specialty. Yeah. So some of them really want to exploit a very particular niche. Let's just say you're exploiting a niche within construction. You don't want to be part of the construction division of the bigger, broader entity who might be doing much more than you want to do. And in fact, we have one of those scenarios. Well, I suppose you have that you don't want to dilute and each of them are jealous of their own PL and they don't want the other one messing around with it. Well, you know what it is? Some of them might bring a different mousetrap. Yeah. They have a bit of a different offering. And we have a situation like that where we play in a very challenging part of the construction market, but we do it in a very, very particular way. Will it be a hundred million dollar offering for us? No. Is it one that kind of ebbs and flows with some cycles with a bit more sensitivity? Yes. Has it been incredibly successful? Yes, it has. I'm not so sure that model would have been as successful sitting in the, if you will, the mainframe insurance company. So we see a little bit of that happening. But I think over our tenure with Ethos, we've written nearly $650 million of premium art with very enviable combined ratios and have made our trading partners a significant return. So we see the model working. We're even more intrigued by it as we go forward, as we see the different solutions to partner with different forms of capital. But again, to that description I gave about that institutional level capability, that opens a lot of doors, not just for attracting talent, but it brings a lot of different capital solutions to your door as well. So as we kind of think about that, a lot of these themes kind of fall into this bucket that we refer to as underwriting and platform as a service. And we think that's part of that, again, that disaggregation of the value chain further than that. So we like where we sit. We think it's a very important strategic part of the group and are going to continue to support and certainly work hard to see it get to that next level. And the last one on the hybrid carrier question is one of the theories that was put to me was one of the secular reasons behind this is that perhaps in the olden days when 
you were a global reinsurer, you probably wrote 100 different Zurich treaties 30 years ago. You had wrote Zurich, Peru, Zurich, England, Zurich, Canada, you know, and you had all sorts of different treaties, relationships with them. It almost certainly wasn't very efficient. And now maybe you just have one, everything's into Zurich, done centrally, and there's one big retro deal out of Zurich reinsurance entity there. And these days, reinsurers have lost some of that more stable and low premium, low volatility type business that they would have got perhaps on, often on quota shares with smaller territories within large global businesses. And that they kind of miss having some of that stable sort of runs at 99 forever type business. And that accessing MGUs is another way for them to try and get back into some of that small commercial business that they feel they've lost now that those relationships with those large global insurers have all changed that they've all centralized their insurance buying. Is that a plausible theory? Yeah, I really haven't considered that angle much, but it is. But I think there's a deeper sort of story behind it because we see it all the time, which is there's a growing range of capital that are looking for exposure to specialty risk, but might not want to make that long-term investment. So whether it's reinsurance capital, whether it's really any capital in the PNC space that might want to find its way to a niche trade somewhere that they don't want to make the investment in having to build it organically. But you also see life capital. You see broader institutional capital flows from the bigger, broader capital markets. So I think that theme, again, of matching risk to capital and the disaggregation of the value chain applies to everybody, not just sort of a reinsurer who used to have many more opportunities you know, we used to hear this debate over time that the reinsurance market has become kind of like a cat market. So mm -hmm. as the underlying seedings became bigger, we're retaining more. And so what they were transferring was a higher tone of volatility. Yes. Is that the case? Probably to a degree. But I also think we've seen other companies who are in the front category who are attracting capital that is completely outside the space. And they're now broadening beyond property into the casualty and professional lines areas. So I think, again, those themes of the value chain kind of changing, disaggregating, matching risk to capital will take on a lot of new forms. So this is you taking your place in that, acknowledging that sometimes there'll be third-party capital sitting alongside you. Sometimes maybe it'll take all of it or whatever. But back 10 years ago, when we talked about third-party capital, we only really meant retro. We meant ILS type stuff, big high-end cat exposure, the very top, top layers. And these days, you're saying it's getting closer and therefore perhaps some of this secular trend is about that capital trying to access more specialty risk as well as just cat risk. Yeah. I mean, just look at the data. If you look at the overall industry surplus, and if you include the different forms of capital into that calculus, I mean, it's growing, growing, growing that are trying to find their way to risk. But again, there are those regulatory hurdles. And so I think there's a kind of a bigger, broader secular shift. What we like about our strategy is we can plug into that disaggregation in multiple different ways. So, of course, the MGU is kind of a front and center version, but so is our reinsurance business. And let's not forget, by the way, what's the other big theme you've seen over the last year? Captives, the growth in captives, single parent group are to the roof. Is that in response to more challenging underlying market conditions, perhaps, but I think any captive manager or captive consultant would be quick to remind their clients, this is not something you do for a short-term trade. So that feels a little more secular. So it's not just front companies, but it's captives and it's other things. So I think, again, if you think about that intersection I mentioned before, where MGU sit, they sit at that intersection of all these things happening. And so we as a group are very agile in how we can kind of trade these different dynamics and provide services. So as long as it's risk, you can be agnostic about how you access it and how you get the capital to it. We are, and we're thinking about it. We're trying to, of course, do it in the most efficient and productive way, but having the flexibility to entertain it through a number of different vehicles and, and avenues is part of that next act for the Ascot Group, and it's what we're so excited by. What about Ascot more specifically? We're in a pretty good market. You've got some pretty impressive growth targets. How are you going to hit those without dropping any underwriting quality? Have you got a particular secret source? What's your way of going about this? Well, I think some of it is we have committed largely to an organic strategy. So by definition, that's going to be highly dependent on market conditions. But we think we can grow significantly in you know, the next several years. Any organic strategy is going to be fueled by talent. So we're attracting a lot of talent to the organization. We're very active in our recruitment efforts. We've been very pleased and humbled, candidly, by the quality of talent that is joining. 
So we see lots of opportunities, lots of disruptions all over the place. And as we build our product set and as we create more diversification, whether that's via product, you know, again, our geographies, we've talked a little bit about the distribution channels. We see more opportunities meeting return hurdles that we set for ourselves. So we talked a little bit about that underwriting culture and pedigree. You know, we don't yeah. believe in big bets. We don't believe in being overweight. And we're very sensitive to our risk profiles and are constantly thinking about that. But we see a lot of opportunities. So yeah, I mean, the growth rates right now are extraordinary off of a bit of a smaller base, but we don't see anything really changing that outlook in the near term. Let's give that a 12, 24 month horizon. And so we expect that growth to continue. We're a private company, which is great. So we've never believed in growth for the sake of growth. There's a long graveyard of companies who tried that strategy that's not ours. So if something changes in that dynamic, we'll be patient, we'll wait. But one of the things we see happening today is our disciplined approach to the market has been very valued. Tough markets, easier markets, hard soft, however we want to define it. Our consistent approach has been very valued by our trading partners, our brokers, our clients. And so even now, if we think about a disrupted market, think about on the treaty side, property cat, we get a lot of knocks in the door because we really haven't changed our stature. We've been very clear about our risk return parameters. We've been clear where we'll trade. We haven't exited that market. We've been a mainstay in that market, but in a very disciplined way. So we now see a lot of opportunity there. We didn't really count on that in the beginning part of the year. Things have changed a bit as we're moving throughout. So the markets move towards you rather than you moving towards the market. 100%. We haven't really done much different. We kind of looked at it like, wow, the opportunities are really seeming to be more profound. It's a good strategy because everyone knows when you go into McDonald's, you know, you order a Big Mac, don't you? You know, you don't go into McDonald's if you want chicken. So that's very true. There's a lot of value in that. And it's easy to say it's hard to do. Yeah. And our brokers are really good at what they do. So they're really good at trying to get you to maybe move a little bit outside of your comfort zone or your sphere. But you know, we've got a pretty resolute team. We've got a lot of experience. It's one of the other great attributes of Ascot. People really enjoy the culture here and how we do things. They stay in their chairs for a long time. So we've had consistency of the trade, consistency of the approach to market. And I think that's creating a lot of opportunities. So we see growth opportunities in several areas, in several geographies across insurance, reinsurance, of course, underwriting services will continue to be opportunistic. We'll continue to look for that better way, so to speak. So there's nothing, again, on that near-term horizon that makes us feel we're going to be anything other than on the trajectory we're on. Obviously, it'd be wrong for me not to ask you about this. I don't expect you to be able to say much, but perhaps to focus on, obviously, Ascot in the process of finding a new investor, a new Keystone investor. How do you cope with the potential distractions that that can cause staff? You know, you're a private company. I'm sure you want to stay a private company. And it does seem to be the way the world is stacked up these days that it's eminently feasible to stay a private company and be a lot larger than your own size. So we wouldn't expect you to have to do some other kind of corporate activity like go public, for example. But how do you keep everyone focused when they open up my former colleagues' newspapers every day and they hear this or that? It's an inevitable reality you're faced with. And I've been involved with m and before several times, but candidly, I've always been on the buy side. So it's a bit of a new experience for me as well. Change always comes with a sense of, I guess, trepidation, fear of the unknown. That's natural. We're all human. And yet I would say that's stated. Ascot is undeniably a very successful, growing, and vibrant organization. We're not an organization that requires fixing. We're not broken. Our market presence, our profile, and most importantly, our results validate that. So it starts from a little bit of a different perspective. We're kind of a little bit more, dare I say, front foot in this dynamic. And that gives all of us comfort. We know there's a really solid, excellent platform that we're operating from and candidly gives us motivation to work even harder to improve that. What I would say is we have really thoroughly committed and prioritized, which is, I think, a key part of this, to keep our colleagues completely informed to the degree we can of where we are in the journey, provide lots of formats and forums to answer their questions, what's on their minds. It's tough because as you said, yes, there's things in the press that come through and some are accurate, some are very inaccurate, but it doesn't really matter. They're hearing it, they're seeing it. So you have to respond, right? You have to be part of that. So it's time consuming, but it's really what we should be doing as leaders. And I think our colleagues have really appreciated the candor, the commitment of time, and the energy and effort we put into that. And I would be hugely remiss if I didn't comment on how proud we are of our colleagues for 
not only exercising our business plan and executing it well during these times, but their commitment to ASCOT and each other and this thing we call the ASCOT way, all inspired by how they react in this environment and what they're doing. And it gives us the motivation and the energy and the enthusiasm to stay at it. So whatever the outcome is, we're going to be confident it's going to be a good one for the group and for our colleagues. Remember the old IPC re-advert that they used to have and when we had glossy reinsurance magazines back 20 years ago, they had a tea bag and it had a kettle and it said, you don't know how strong it is until you put it in hot water. Right. If it doesn't break you, it makes you stronger. And if it's a test of the culture and of the solidarity of your colleagues and how they all interact with each other. So I wish you all the best with that. Thank you. These days, it sounds dramatic. And I think now that we've known that there is a modus operandi for you can take one private equity investor, one private owner, and then swap them in for another or two or three, a consortium of two or three or whatever it ends up being. I think we now know that that's not as terrifying as it seems. It might actually become more natural to people to say, yeah, every five years, this probably happens, but don't worry because we'll continue. We're still Ascot. It's just, we have another lucky new owner who will hopefully double their investment over that period. I wish you all the best with that because it, it can't be easy and it must always be stressful. So when that's all done and you're well into your next period of growth, make sure you come back on the program and we'll have a catch up. Uh, well, thank you. No, I really appreciate it. It's great to have the chance to chat with you about uh, so many of the happenings. It's a super exciting time in our industry. You know, again, in my almost 30 years, I haven't seen any of the dynamics at this pace of this magnitude. Really excited by our strategy. And, and, and by the way, some of our potential partners going forward are equally enthusiastic and can help us pursue those in ways that we think make us even more resilient, resolute, and determined to push into that future, that new frontier, if you will. Yes, I'm aging myself. I think we both started the industry around the same time, John. So I wish you all the best with the next ventures. Good luck with the new funding, new structure, whatever may emerge, and come and speak to us soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate the time. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, don't forget to subscribe or leave a like or a review or recommendation on whatever podcast platform you used to access this program. These really help get the word out. Before we go, just a quick reminder that advertising slots are available here and in other places in the Voice of Insurance podcasts. Podcasting is the fastest growing medium and attracts a high quality audience of key decision makers. It's also an intimate medium where you, the listener, are right in the room with me and the interview subjects. Needless to say, that means it's a great way of getting your message out directly to an audience because you know you've got their full attention. It's also very cost effective. So get in touch with Mark at thevoiceofinsurance.com to find out how you could be speaking directly to the industry. The Voice of Insurance podcast is produced in association with Advantage Go, enabling enterprise-scale underwriting through a single pane of glass. Voice of Insurance is produced by me, Mark Gagan. Music was written by Anna Gagan and produced by Carlos Gagan. Check out more podcasts and written comment pieces at www.thevoiceofinsurance.com.